Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Pip Langford, uh, chair of co-chair of Outdoor Recreation Network. We'll just wait a couple of minutes just to make sure everybody's arrived. But in the meantime, if I could ask you to turn your cameras and microphones off just to help with bandwidth. Um, we can turn them back on later, but if we can turn them off during the presentation, that'd be great. Thanks very much. Right, it's turned 10.46, so I think we'll make a, a start. Um, can I just remind people that it would be good if you could turn your cameras and microphones off um, during the lecture so that we can preserve bandwidth and make sure everybody gets to see everything um, and hear everything. Um, other things just to note, the, the session is being recorded, um, so if you don't want to appear on the screen, please make sure your um, camera is turned off at all times. And if you do have questions or you want to make points, please add them to the chat as we go through. That would be really helpful. And just one last piece of housekeeping. If you require live captions, then there's a way of turning them on. So you go to the three dots at the top of your um, team screen and then turn on live captions. Just a short introduction for myself. I'm Pippa Langford. My day job is Principal Specialist of Recreation at Natural England. Um, and as part of that role, I'm also co-chair of the Outdoor Recreation Network. Um, we have an executive committee who actually run the, the who run the network and we have um, some full time, some paid staff as well. If you're not familiar with the Outdoor Recreation Network, it's actually been around since 1968, first as CRAG, the Countryside Recreation Research Advisory Group, and then the Countryside Recreation Network, and now we're the Outdoor Recreation Network. And our vision is encouraging more people to enjoy and engage with the outdoors. We collaborate to share research, facilitate information exchange and champion sustainable good practice. And we do that through a succession of webinars and face to face meetings. It's a great place to meet other professionals who are working on similar issues and do, or doing research and trialing new solutions. And we had a great um, time out in um, Snowdonia this year where we actually had sunshine for the whole of our conference. We've held an online pre-Christmas event for several years um, with a presentation followed by a member meeting. So if you haven't signed up to the member meeting, we will provide you with a link to it at the end. This year, we wanted to be inspired, so we invited Dame Fiona Reynolds to speak to us. She's had a long career in leadership roles in the voluntary and public sectors. I first heard of Fiona while she was director of the Council for the Protection of Rural England, which is now called the Campaign to Protect Rural England. She was that from 1987 to 1998. Um, and she'd previous part before that been secretary to the Council for National Parks, who you'll probably be familiar with. At our time, at, after her time at CPRE, she moved to become director of the Women's Unit in the Cabinet Office to the year 2000. And from there, um, she moved on to the role where she's probably best known to many of us on this call as the Director General of the National Trust from 2001 to 2012. From 2021, from, sorry, from 2012, she was Master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and she was then appointed as Chair of the National Audit Office in January this year, last year, sorry, 21. She has a whole host of other roles. She's a really busy person. She's chair of the Governing Council of the Royal Agricultural University at Cirencester, the International National Trust Organisation, the Cathedral's Fabric Commission for England, Cambridge University's Botanic Garden and Cambridge University's Bennett Institute for Public Policy. 
She's also a trustee of the Grosvenor Estate, the Green Alliance and the Food Farming and Countryside Commission and a non-exec director of Wessex Water. And we are hugely grateful that Fiona has found a slot in her very busy diary to deliver the Outdoor Recreation Network annual lecture. So Fiona, over to you. Well, thank you, Pippa. Uh, thanks for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's lovely to be here, and I'm sure there are lots of old friends and colleagues uh, online. Um, but you're not going to see me for very long because I'm going to share my screen because I have lots of lovely pictures for you. Because, as I think you know, I'm going to be talking about beauty. Let me just let, hope this works. I hope you can all see that. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about the fight for beauty and why it matters more than ever. Now, beauty is an interesting word. It's a word we all use all the time to describe places and experiences that, that make us happy and glad to be alive, whether we're talking about the beauty of landscape. I need to see if this. Or whether we're talking about the beauty of nature. Or whether we're talking about our cultural heritage, beauty is a word that comes to us readily and frequently. But it's not a word that is readily used by politicians. It's almost as if they're embarrassed to talk about something that feels a bit emotional or sentimental. They are focused on the economy. And my goodness, have we heard about that recently and believe that everything that matters has to be measured so they don't like subtle or um, words that, that, that don't carry with, carry with them the, the emotion that, that beauty does. In fact, we've substituted a sort of management speak for beauty. Um, words like biodiversity or natural capital uh, have substituted for what in the old days we were very happy just to talk about beauty. But you know, it wasn't always like this. Beauty is a word that's been used frequently throughout history in all kinds of contexts. It was Chaucer that wrote, it was the beauty of an April spring that long and folk to go on pilgrimages. Can't you just imagine that April spring uh, in the depths of winter now? And the people who built our churches and cathedrals didn't build uh, utilitarian buildings. This is a Saxon chapel in Elkstone near where I live in Gloucestershire. And this is the glorious medieval Ely Cathedral. They built with the glory of God, they built beautifully and they built in a way that would last as it has done for many thousands of years. And over history, poets, artists, musicians have all written about beauty, perhaps particularly the romantic poets and of course, perhaps particularly this man, William Wordsworth, who wrote extraordinary words about beauty and our landscape and nature. Uh, his, perhaps one of his most famous works, uh, lines written above Tintern Abbey in 1798. He wrote, to recognise in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul. So he was writing about beauty um, very strongly emotionally, not, not just about aesthetics, but about the moral purpose that was associated with beauty. He was also, of course, writing about the Lake District, and this is a contemporary image in the 1820s of the Lake District by John Glover. Um, this is actually Thirlmere before it was drowned. And we can recognise the Lake District very different in many ways. At shaggier, more trees. Perhaps this is something we might wish to return to. But anyway, there it is, the beauty of the Lake District. But already, as he was writing about the Lake District, the threats were beginning to mount. It was already under threat. And in his uh, Guide to the Lakes, first published in 1810, he talked about uh, the invasion of the suburban villas, he talked about the quarrying, and he talked about the spiky larch replacing these beautiful deciduous woodlands and how much he hated it. But perhaps he's best known for opposing the railway to Windermere, and in 1843 those momentous words, is there no nook of English ground secure from rash assault? gave birth to what for many of us was the conservation movement. It was the first battle and it was the shift, if you like, from the admiration and celebration of beauty to the recognition that it needed defence. 
But if there was a rash assault uh, affecting the Lake District, perhaps the really biggest rash assault was that uh, as a result of urban development. And this famous cartoon, George Cruikshank in 1829, um, shows how this kind of fear of the way that uh, development was invading the countryside was becoming prevalent. So you can see the bricks pouring out of the kiln and landed on the hayricks as they scurry for their lives. You can see the automatons marching on the countryside. And you can see the um, rapidly built but equally rapidly decaying uh, ranks of housing, which was seen to be so destructive. The rate of development was intense. Between 1831 and 1836 in Sheffield alone, 156 new streets were built and they were not glamorous streets. At the time, of course, there was real concern about the appalling conditions in which many people lived. Huge public concern about cholera, typhoid, about lack of water and sanitation and these really grim conditions in which many people lived, leading to public outrage. We remember Edwin Chadwick, whose Royal Commission looked at the conditions of the poor. And within that, there was a very strong sense that one of the really appalling uh, deprivations of these people was not just the basic uh, needs of life, but also their complete lack of access to beauty in any form. And out of this cacophony of concern came another campaigner for beauty, John Ruskin. He was a polymath, um, known as, a, as an artist, a philosopher, um, but actually as a child, he was concerned about beauty. He had a cyanometer to measure the blueness of the sky, believing that because of the smoke and pollution pouring out of the factories, there would never be blue sky again. He had an epiphany in the Chamonix Valley where he watched the clouds crashing over the landscape and believed that beauty was somehow spiritually and morally uh, lacking from our lives and he would devote his life to campaigning for it. He gave public lectures up and down the country, crammed full of people and he inspired many people. He inspired the foundation of the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings. He inspired William Morris and his arts and crafts movements and he inspired this young woman Octavia Hill. Now I'm sure many of you will have heard of her. She is my heroine um, and she is a young woman taught in a ragged school in London and used to march the children out to Epping Forest 10 miles away. That was a long walk uh, for small children. Uh, simply to feel green grass under their feet, to breathe fresh air and to pick flowers and to feel beauty in their lives because they had none of it in central London. She became known, as many of you will know, as a housing campaigner, but she was more than that. She believed everybody was entitled to beauty and she would provide little gardens, she would provide window boxes if that was all that was possible. And she also joined the campaign for green spaces to be protected in London, what she called open air sitting rooms for the poor, this idea that everybody needs a space to enjoy and to be free and to feel the beauty around them. And of course, very famously with her colleagues, uh, Canon Hardwick Rawnsley here in the middle in the Lake District and Robert Hunter, the uh, lawyer for the um, Pres Open Spaces, now the Open Spaces Society, then the Commons Preservation Society. These tri this trio established the National Trust, an organisation devoted to beauty. Now, we all know about the National Trust, don't we? We know about the great estates, the big houses and all the rest of it. But actually, the founding mission wasn't about big houses in any shape or form. It was about countryside, particularly close to towns, vernacular buildings and the need for beauty in everybody's lives. And their legacy is not to protect the past, but actually to build a beautiful and a caring future. And I, I'm always very struck that something that is not necessarily attributed to them, but I know they campaigned for was the first planning act in 1909, which called for the home healthy, the house beautiful, the town pleasant, the city dignified, and the suburbs salubrious, recognising that beauty in the way that we develop and move forward as a country was important. So the government was listening to them as well. But of course, the government's efforts were shattered by the First World War. Their attention was distracted by war and a collapsing economy and all the trials and tribulations of a horrible war. Mm. But the people 
didn't forget beauty. And there are moving stories of young men going to the trenches with a copy of A.E. Hausman's A Shropshire Lad in their breast pockets, knowing that they were fighting for England. And that wonderful story about Edward Thomas, who, who resisted signing up till very late in the war. And then when he did, and he was asked why, he picked up a clod of earth and said, I'm fighting for England, for the beauty of England. And of course, he died almost uh, as the war ended. But as the war ended, the government promised land and homes fit for heroes. They wanted to bring people back to good housing and to all the things that they deserved. Uh, and the, the, the promises they made, sadly, were broken by the shattered society, the shattered economy, the outbreak of Spanish flu. The government simply could not deliver on its promises for those people returning from the war. And of course, when there's a vacuum, when there's a, uh, a space to occupy, there are people who will always step into that void. And the people who stepped into that void after the war were the speculative developers um, who started building. This is a, one example along the Bath Road, just building along main roads anywhere they could. There were no planning controls. There was no framework for development. It was quick. It was fast. It was cheap. It was not beautiful. And so this gave rise, this, this sudden expansion of urban sprawl gave rise to a new fight for beauty led by such luminaries as Patrick Abercrombie, who was a founder of CPRE, the organisation I used to work for, as you know, um, by Clough Williams Ellis, uh, the architect whose wonderful book, England and the Octopus, captured all the evils of sprawl. Uh, this wonderful illustration showing the octopus's tentacles gobbling up the beauties of rural England. And then people like G.M. Trevelyan, the Regis Professor of History at Cambridge University, who's published a pamphlet, a rhetorical title was, Must England's Beauty Perish? Fearing that the whole of England was now subject to this sort of tawdry, cheap and nasty development. In fact, J.B. Priestley, writing in the 1930s, said, our 20th century spoiling has been much worse than the 19th century. Instead of concentrating the nasty attack on a few districts, it has set to work to ruin the look of the whole island. This was an extraordinarily strongly felt emotion. It wasn't anti-urban, it wasn't anti-development, but it was anti-sprawl, wasteful use of land and the poor quality of development. And this campaign persuaded the government to act. There was in 1932 a planning act which extended planning, mainly it's still in urban areas, and in 1935, the Restriction of Ribbon Development Act. So actually really important statements about protecting the countryside from sprawl. But the efforts in that direction were once again disrupted by war. But once again, uh, beauty was used to inspire the troops. And this is one of the series of wartime posters, I'm sure very familiar to many of you. Beautiful England, inspiring people, your Britain, fight for it now. But of course, not a not a hint of spool in these pictures was there. But this time it was going to be different. Never again, said Churchill, leading the wartime alliance, will we make promises and break them. Never again will we make the same mistakes as, as were made after the end of the First World War. And so even while the war was in progress, he set up the post-war reconstruction committee composed of a cross-party alliance of politicians and bringing in experts from the outside to prepare the country for a beautiful, safe and uh, equal future for everybody. They commissioned a whole raft of reports, many of which will be familiar to us today. The Beverage Report on, on Welfare and Health, the Barley Report on the Future of Business and the Economy, Upwork Report looking at planning and compensation, and the Scott report on rural areas, a really comprehensive review. And in all of those, do you know, land was absolutely central. This idea that there were good uses of land to promote public benefit and there were bad uses of land of which sprawl was absolutely at the top of the list. And so there was a strong sense that we needed to be careful and fair and responsible in the way that we use land in order to deliver public benefits across the piece. So Churchill was ready, but do you know, remember who won the election? It wasn't Churchill, 
it was aptly. And I show you this picture only to show that there was one woman at least in the cabinet. Uh, on the far right of the picture, Ellen Wilkinson, who was Minister for Education, but look at them all. But, you know, this, this cabinet took forward the recommendations of the post-war reconstruction committee. It was a cross-party alliance, but implemented by the incoming Labour government. And they put in place those plans for the returning heroes from the Second World War. And they very explicitly set out that they wanted to meet people's material needs for housing, for jobs, for you know, basic incomes and, and, and security, but they also were committed to meeting people's non-material needs. And in that case, beauty was very central to their thinking. So as well as legislation on education, health, housing jobs and welfare, there was legislation for beauty. And you will know much of it. Uh, first of all, the National Parks in the 1949 Act, this is the Peak District, the first to be designated in the very early 1950s. And then public access, because this was seen as absolutely integral to the whole uh, vision of to uh, for people. And there's a wonderful quote from John Silkin introducing the act in 1949, who said, the enjoyment of our leisure in the open air, the ability to leave our towns and walk on the moors and in the dales without fear of interruption, are just as much a part of positive health and well-being as are the buildings of hospitals or insurance against sickness. So there you have it. They were thinking about that health and well-being benefits right from the start back in the 1940s. Now, this picture, I don't know if it's familiar to any of you, but this is Tom Stevenson at the front leading a party of six MPs, three of them members of the cabinet, on a three-day walk in Northumberland along the putative Pennine way to show to the public the benefits of outdoor recreation, the thing that you all care so much about. Now, I would love to take six MPs, three of them members of the cabinet, on a three day walk along the Pennine way, but I don't know if they would join me today. Wasn't that a display of public and political support? Now, that 1949 Act also, of course, introduced for the first time proper protection for nature. This is Ben A, which was the first national nature reserve to be created um, in Britain. And we also uh, legislated for green belts. This is a rather poor photograph, but it's the Sheffield green belt. Again, a hangover, if you like, from the uh, anti sprawl movement about the need to separate town from country and have a very clear edge to settlements to stop sprawl. And of course, we did need housing. So this was this was not a stopping government. It was an enabling government, but of the right kind. And so, of course, the new towns, which were a huge part of that post-war reconstruction programme, uh, were very important. Now, this is Stevenage in the 1950s. And although, you know, we look at it now and what, what we might have different views about it, but there's a little bit of Octavia in there, isn't there? Lots of trees and green spaces and a recognition that people do need to live in an environment which gives them access to beauty in some form. Perhaps above all, it was the 1947 Planning Act, which though was crucial to this relationship between development and beauty, because it sought explicitly to enable the development that we needed as a society, but also to protect what we wanted to protect, whether that was national parks or green belts or the wider countryside. That act explicitly sought harmony and balance and the good use of land based on all of those reports that have been commissioned. And it was an enormously important statement about how to make good things happen in good ways, but also how to protect the things we care about from damage and disruption. Now, you could say it's all been pretty much downhill since then because that perhaps was the high point in the way that beauty was really thought about and really integrated in our thinking. And so the fight for beauty has had to be revived time and time again. And since 1980, since I've been involved in this movement, I've been involved in many of those battles. So in a way, the next short section of this is to talk about those battles and what, what we've learned. These, these were my fights and many of them caused by, despite good policies, the race for growth that never had it so good kind of feeling of the 1950s and 60s, which just downgraded beauty and the non-material aspects of that post-war vision. 
First one is farming, and perhaps this is the biggest mistake that post-war government made. It did not see farming as a threat in any way to beauty or to nature, um, partly because it was a bit like this. It was still largely unmechanised and, and nobody even anticipated what came. And of course, we all know what came was a massive intensification of agriculture and transformation of the countryside, the removal of hedgerows and trees and the ploughing up of downland and semi-natural habitats. Um, I was involved in the very early 1980s in the fight for Exmoor against intensification and the reclamation of moorland um, for pasture. 27% uh, was lost between 1947 and 1980. The very reason Exmoor was designated was its heather moorland. And of course, we all know that 97% of hay meadows were lost between 1945 and 1984. And that decline is, is, is has continued since and much, much else. And yet, of course, with agriculture, we can and we must get it right. Uh, agriculture can be sustainable. Agriculture can support nature. It can support recreation. It can support uh, sustainable land management um, if we get it right. And of course, in this post-Brexit world, we have the opportunity to get it right. It's taking a long time and there are real concerns about the ELM scheme and where we've got to. We can and we must redesign farm policy, though, to provide a much more joined up and sustainable system to support farming. Now, there have been lots of fights about trees. Trees are generally seem to be a good thing, but of course, in the period just after the First World War, when the Forestry Commission was set up, they saw the quick wins as being about planting upland areas with Sitka spruce, and there were massive rows, especially in the Lake District, which is Ennerdale, in the 1920s. And I'm very struck, you know, Wordsworth hated the spiky larch, but would he have thought of the Sitka spruce, which was planted in, in its millions over the landscape that he loved. Now, that was a, a fight about the 1920s and 30s, but my goodness, it was still going on in the 80s when I joined CNP. And this is in the Brecon Beacons, the kind of forestry plantation we were still campaigning against hard-edged, no variety of species, plonked in the middle of a semi-natural habitat. That was still going on, but we haven't resolved the forestry and woodland situation even now. Uh, we're still seeing massive loss of ancient woodlands. Um, the HS2 line is the, is the latest culprit, all in the name of progress. And some of you will remember um, in the 2012, the government proposed to sell off the national forests, including ancient forests like this one, um, which is the New Forest, but also the Forest of Dean and many of the other historic forests around the country, all for short term financial gain, simply not understanding how deeply important these places were and are to people as places of history, of nature, of recreation and outdoor experience, but actually a deeply part of our DNA as a country. So the rows about trees haven't stopped and, and even now as we've got plans to plant lots of trees, are we going to get the right tree in the right place? Will, will beauty in nature win against short term uh, economic imperatives? Now, a bit of good news, a battle won uh, because one of the big fights in the early 20th century was over the coastline, which saw massive problems of sprawl of its own, caravan parks, bungalows, everyone rushing to build along the coast. And it was CPRE and the National Trust that ran a campaign to highlight the importance of the coast and to uh, map large areas of the coastline to identify uh, what should be protected. And of course, the National Trust's famous Neptune campaign, which was one of the most proactive and one of the most effective in the world, I should say, um, ways of protecting coastline, had really has made a huge difference to the extent that Almost anywhere, if you go to um, European coastlines or to America, you see massive problems of sprawl. And we have succeeded in protecting uh, much of our coastline, but only because a charity stepped in, uh, a charity with, with enormous, enormous vision uh, at the time. Now, back to back to the bad news, which was which was roads and transport, because I spent much of the 80s and 90s campaigning against really insensitive road developments 
You may recognise this as the M3 extension uh, near Winchester, uh, right through St Catherine's Hill, which is a very, very important landmark, almost a religious, certainly a spiritual site. Um, and there were just huge, huge rows about it. The Department of Transport had at the time what they called a predict and provide policy, which meant that if the traffic demand was there, the road got built. And despite huge objections, I'm sure you'll remember Swampy um, and many other characters taking taking to the trees and, and objecting. But this was this was a program of absolute sort of determinism to just you know, meet an economic need without apparent consideration of beauty or nature or any of those other important things. And so you know, we think we've solved these, but we've now got the HS2 problem. Now, actually, I'm going to tell you the good story first. This is HS1 as it goes through Kent. And it's a really remarkable story because, of course, everyone was worried about a new railway line through the Garden of England. But the then leader of Kent County Council, who was Sandy Bruce Lockhart, um, said, well, you know, I'm... I understand we've got to have a railway to the to the to the Channel Tunnel, and um, you know we, we we accept it's got to go. But I'm going to make sure it goes through with the least damage we can possibly achieve. And so he took HS1, the company, and made them have public meetings and visit every village that might be affected until they found the least damaging line through the county. And it's gone in with almost no protest. Now HS2, of course, has had you know massive protests. And I think one of the reasons is because they drew the line on the map and then tried to backfill the environmental arguments, whereas actually doing it proactively, I think, would have been much more successful. But underneath all these rounds, it was mostly about planning um, and that, that 1947 Act and its attempt to balance and achieve harmony, because we didn't always get it right. And some of the post-war development was really pretty awful. And I think, you know, that really gave rise to some of the problems this is the sort of 1950s urban development um, and many of my fights throughout my time sorry the quality of this picture but it's to illustrate that you know taking green fields for housing development without trying to build places and settlements was hugely controversial and remains so to this day just think of the row in parliament uh, the other day and again i was involved in many many campaigns to stop the government from tearing up the green belt or uh, reducing the effectiveness of the planning system over over more than 20 uh, more than 30 years i should say campaigning uh, in this area and perhaps the most famous campaign was the uh, national planning policy uh, re proposed reforms in 2011 where the government put out a document which basically said the answer to any planning application the default answer should be yes which was a total uh, renouncement of all the principles of balance and harmony that the 1947 Act had, had tried to achieve. So we, we ran a big campaign, unusually for the National Trust, a petition at our properties and taking it into Parliament. But people felt so passionately that this was wrong. We had immense public support for it. And in the end, although we didn't win outright, we certainly got the worst of those ideas. Um, pulled back, but there are still rows about planning. You know, the investment zones uh, announced by the trust government, it's still a problem that planning is seen as the obstacle to growth and therefore it needs to be reduced in effectiveness. But we can and we must get it right. And we can. I mean, this is a, a nice example of uh, rural housing, affordable rural housing in a, a village near me in Gloucestershire, trying modern, unashamedly modern, but reflecting the character of the place. This is a very green development in Cambridge uh, near the city centre designed to show how modern urban, urban living can be incredibly sustainable. So it's a very low energy development with very few cars and it's incredibly popular. And of course, urban regeneration itself. This is uh, Newcastle city centre, as many of you will know, a city I love where millions and millions have been poured into make, making this city centre a good place to live to thrive, to be green, to help people live more sustainable lives. And so, you know, we can get it right. We kind of know what we need to do, but we're fighting against this imperative of growth. And yet now, now we're in crisis. We had a triple crisis of nature, climate and health, which we all know about. 
and we have a cost of living crisis. And again, I think the really big question is, can we look into the long term and make the right decisions to meet those tri that triple crisis? Or are we going to be trumped? Is it going to be trumped by the cost of living crisis and we're going to go for short term economic gain? And that really is the crunch issue. I've talked a lot about fights with the government. I've talked a lot about the problems of public policy. But actually, this comes down to what we all care about. And it comes down to a word which I like to use. It's not a, not a word many people use again, but it's economism and whether that trumps everything. Now, what is economism? Um, economism was defined by Albert J. Nock, an economist in 1943, who said, economism can build a society which is rich, prosperous, powerful, even one which has a reasonably wide diffusion of material well-being. It cannot build one which is lovely, one which has savour and depth, and which exercises the irresistible power of attraction that loveliness wields. That point about loveliness and about making our economy work for everyone's happiness. This is what it's all about. And yet we are still hearing all about growth, aren't we? Shopping, GDP, they are the things that dominate the news. Every single time I hear about, oh, GDP is up or down, that is what worries politicians. And yet GDP is a terrible way of measuring progress. It's only about incomes and expenditure. There is no balance sheet to GDP. And all of us who care about the countryside and love and, and concern about our environment, know that it's the balance sheet that matters, and we've been steadily undermining the balance sheet for so long. So this is a point. It's about the values that we have passed on and the way we think about these things, because they are not getting better. There's so much focus on growth, and in spite of important commitments to nature and carbon, they are worsening globally. So what can we do? And my last pitch is really about the next generation, because that's what I think we can really do. Remember Octavia and those ragged children that she marched out to Epping Forest? Children today spend between six to seven hours a day on devices. The area over which they roam free has fallen by 90% in a single generation. And a child today is three times more likely to be admitted to hospital for falling out of bed and falling out of a tree. Now, I'm not in favour of throwing children out of trees, but I am in favour of giving them access to nature. And this was perhaps the campaign of the National Trust that I'm most proud of, which was it's still in play today. It's the, it's really saying that the thing that most matters is that our children have access to nature, to discover nature, to enjoy nature, but also to discover their own limits and to get muddy and dirty and to, to feel a connection with the natural world. There was some science behind the 11 and three quarters because there was evidence to suggest that habits learned by the age of 12 stay with you for life, whereas if you can learn them in later life, but it's, it's harder. So this to me was, it, it was a very Octavia campaign. It wasn't about the National Trust as an institution or membership or anything else. It's about every child in the country uh, having the opportunity to experience nature. And you'll all know what David Attenborough said, that people will only protect what they care about and only care about what they've experienced. So if we don't give our children access to nature, then frankly, we won't be creating the conditions for sustainability and success in future. Because economism clearly doesn't have all the answers and we do all need beauty. And if there was anything we discovered during the COVID experience, it was that all of us, all of us, wherever we come from, wherever we live, need access to beautiful spaces, to nature, to the opportunity simply to experience the joys of the unmaterial world. It's not the only thing that matters, but it really does matter and we don't take it seriously enough. We need to find ways of making better decisions that take into account the non-material um, invaluable things of life to make the quality of life and our chances for sustainability in the future more promising. Fight for beauty, said John Muir, that's Scott who um, was the founder of the National Parks Movement in America. He said it was not blind opposition to progress, but opposition to blind progress. So that's why I'm 
absolutely passionately committed to the fight for beauty and that's why I hope you will all join me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Fiona. That was a really inspiring lecture. Um, I, I was just transfixed the whole way through. It was, um, yeah, it's taken me out of my day job, out of my, the, dare I say, the rat race of trying to get things done. So um, I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I do. Um, certainly there's been lots of comments have been in the chat about loving the pictures, think it's, you know, a comment from Sophie about she didn't realise the picture of Thelmere was a, a painting, not a photograph. <laughs> so, yes, lots of lovely comments in, in the chat and lots of people liking the 50 things to do before 11 and three quarters. Yeah, um, I must admit, I when my son was younger, we went out and we did quite a few of them. Um, and, and so, yes, it was it was really useful for him. And and I don't know whether it was that or um, the fact I just dragged him out for walks when he didn't want to, but now he likes going for walks and he's even started volunteering on a local nature site, um, doing some scrub bashing, which surprised me. And he likes bird watching too. So um, something must have worked somewhere along the lines. So we've got some hands up um, for questions. Um, and uh, I'd just like to go, I think uh, the first one up was Jonathan Clark, if you'd like to, turn yourself off mute and maybe turn your camera on. Um, do you want to ask a question, Jonathan? Jonathan, no, no, he wouldn't. He's put his, he said no. Um, <laughs> is, is it in your, is it, did he put it in the chat? Uh, did he put it in the chat? Uh, no, I can't see it. However, I think um, Bridget, Bridget, um, are you there? I think you had a question you wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Fiona. That was as um, as Pippa's just said. That that's really inspiring. Um, I'm co-chair alongside Pippa, um, and I just we always try and look out as a net as a network. So we encompass colleagues from um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, uh, mm -hmm. as well as England. So. I do, we always, as I say, we look at wondered in your experience, are there any other nations that are fighting for beauty in the way that you describe that we should be looking to, um, that we should use as inspiration? Um, anybody doing it really well out there? Well, I think uh, Wales's Future Generations Act is probably the most um, exciting example. I'm not sure how well it's working in practice. I'm not not involved in Wales so much these days. But I do think this idea that there is a, you know, you, every time you make legislation or policy, you think about future generations is a good way of um, kind of making sure that you think about the things that just don't count when you're making short term decisions. You know, as I as I was describing, I think that, you know, beauty is not just it's not not just about aesthetics. It, it's about it's almost about values and it's about what we think about and trying to capture the quality of life as well as the material things in life and and at least that future generations thing does capture you know the need to think beyond the, the short term but frankly you know all the stats on biodiversity are still going in the wrong direction as you know you know we've, we've got this cop in montreal at the moment the 30 by 30 uh, commitment is is sort of there but actually is is it really effective we've got opportunities with the nature recovery strategies to make a, a, a big difference but is the money going to be there so there's each time, um, each time we have good news, you know, it's caveated by a worry that at the end of the day, the economy just comes marching through. I'm not anti-economy in any shape or form because we need all those things too. But we we do need we do need ways of really thinking more in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. That was that's really just interesting that you mentioned the Wales Future Generation. Um, act yes I do love it when they quote it at me and say we're doing this because and I'm thinking I wish we could have an English one yeah yeah no I do well, I definitely um, and then I, I'm very jealous of our Scottish colleagues who have their, their dare I say their right to roam on foot bike and horse so they kind yeah. of get over that idea that actually you're welcome yeah and yeah. and now how do we manage it not mm, we'll, we'll keep you out and and, and think about it later. Um, I think we had a question from Northern Ireland. Elizabeth, if you're on the call, I think you were going to ask a question because um, 
Northern Ireland has have been doing quite a bit recently, trying to open up access to the outdoors um, because they they don't have a path network. They don't have uh, a right to roam in any way. So in a way, they're, they're struggling to start from a, a position where there, there, there isn't a there may be traditions of people going out, but there, it's very difficult for them to find places to go. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth has been doing quite a bit of work on that. Elizabeth, if you can come yeah, take you. yourself off mute. Yes, thank you, Pippa. I've kept my camera off because I've been joining from a very old stone farmhouse, so the Wi-Fi <laughs> is a bit poor. <laughs> and I'm just trying to sort of keep things rolling as good as they can. I see that actually Maya Taylor um, from um, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency has also popped onto the camera. And maybe actually, Maya, because your camera is functioning and you perhaps have better Wi-Fi than me, you're maybe better placed to give an update on, on Northern Ireland. Yeah, so um, I, I guess what we've been doing in Northern Ireland is is um, outdoor recreation and I has, has been able for, for the cross UK or the cross Northern Ireland strategic outdoor recreation. It's sort of all of government and all of the bodies that, that the sort of that, that, that wish to play a part um, have been mapping um, all of the publicly accessible land um, because we're not you know a lot uh, uh, allowed on a lot of private lands so all of the paths and all of the open green spaces so that there is a map and we'll be able to measure how close that is to where people live um with the intention that that will then help identify um where the biggest gaps are that we might need to meet that need and hopefully get that then into use it for our our, our forward planning for for um, area plans for for what we each want to spend money on um, and to generate I guess a, a bit not necessarily competition but like a oh they've got that maybe we could have it just mm -hmm. to inspire those ideas so that we we know what we're hoping to meet and where to best put our resources. That's a short summary. Well, it, it's brilliant. And, and I was very struck when I was at the National Trust, you know, for 12 years and used to go to Northern Ireland regularly, how very different the legislative system was. There's a wonderful man called Paddy Casement, you probably know him, who um, has been working on farm policy for a long time and was, was always, you know, so concerned about actually trying to get, um, you know, more environmental response. But the National Trust, of course, owning quite a the coastline was quite a big provider of access and very glad, very glad to be so. So, yeah, it's crucial. And the access side of things, um, I can see that Hugh Davis has put um, a question about the House of Laws Committee, which I've, I've just been reading, actually, because um, it's an incredibly important uh, report. But that points out that access is the you know, poor relation in a lot of the schemes that are coming forward for nature. And as you said earlier, Peter, there should be no conflict. It should be about how we manage and how we give people access. One of the very few really positive things that came out of COVID was, was local authorities and others recognising that they need to know where people can go. And so your, your point, Maya, about mapping uh, where the public access is available so that you can actually encourage people to, to use the spaces that are available. But it's incredibly important. There are lots and lots of local authorities who are now engaged in looking at what they can do and you know, where, the, where, where the public access uh, black spots are and where the opportunities are. So it is really important. I might just pick up Hugh's question about the land use framework. Uh, I, I personally don't think a strategy is the right answer. I've been pushing for a land use framework but I, forever, but um, finally we've got the government said it's going to produce one, although I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if they hit it next year because DEFRA's just got so much on and it's had two new sections of state, so it's, it doesn't seem to be um, delivering fast at the moment, it hasn't delivered on the Glover review, which is another thing I was involved with. Um, but seriously, the, the land use framework is a really important idea. We have all these siloed uh, commitments on land, you know, to plant lots of trees, to have lots of energy, to have farming, uh, food production, but also nature recovery and, and, and carbon. We have no way of joining them up and to build lots of houses and to provide infrastructure and no way of joining them all up. And the land use framework would be a fantastic tool to help us make better land use decisions. Going back to my point, they did think about this 
in this uh, post-war period. I'm, this is not a political point at all, but I'm just very struck. This is a government, a cross-party alliance that um, really thought carefully about integration of policy ambitions and, and achieving um, you know, good things for the people of this country through a really joined up approach. And we, we've totally lost that in, in recent times. Thanks. I was going to ask you to um, uh, come back to Hugh's question, but you, yeah. you've covered it there. Um, I've got a question. Um, and it sprang to mind um, when you mentioned Glover, because, of course, you were on the commission um, and um, they said you need to be more inclusive. Um, and uh, so far, not much has happened. However, mm. I have seen in the ONBs and the national parks, certainly within the staff, uh, huge um, turnabout and a sort of, yes, we need to be more inclusive, um, a, a realisation mm. moment, which is changing all sorts of conversations, hampered by, dare I say, a lack of funding. Mm. Um, so that it then comes back to how much is this, can it be driven bottom up? And how much do we need top down change, do you think? I think it's a mixture of both, Pippa, and I'm sure you would recognise that. I mean, it, it is quite frustrating that the Glover review recommendations don't seem to be an act on because it, we, we felt as a, as a group that it was pretty much all good news. You know, the opportunities for both national parks and AOMBs together, and we did, it was an absolute breakthrough moment to think of the family as, you know, covering 25% of, of England. So, what a win if you can get those places um, ambitious for nature recovery, ambitious for inclusive access and ambitious for a, you know, exciting, sustainable future for the people who live there. I mean, those those three things coming together and it is it's very frustrating. And so we did feel we needed government leadership and some modest uh, legislative changes um, to achieve that, but actually galvanising um, the local authorities and the national park and authorities and, and, and AOMBs where they have. I mean, I was so impressed by what the AOMBs do on almost nothing. They are incredibly creative and visionary. Um, but galvanising them to think in a different way, um, I think, you know, that's the bottom up bit. So I think I think there has been that culture change. I agree. And it's a great joy to me. I mean, you know, I'm a madly keen walker myself and I'm out on that a lot. Seeing many more diverse audiences and people in the countryside is, is good, but there's a long way to go. And there are loads, I mean, think of those children in Octavia Hill. We've still got that many, many children living in urban areas, but in rural areas too, who just never go out into the countryside. Um, we've got we've got a long way to go, but let's hope we can, um, you know, we can do better. Thanks. Yeah, we can do better. I'm, I'll go with that. Mm. Um, I'll, I think I'll come to our last question. I think it's from Mark Weston, who's mm. the VHS Director for Access. Oh, hello. Hi, Dan Fiona. Um, it won't surprise you, this is an equestrian related question. And, oh. uh, <laughs> one of the uh, historic beauties to me are, are those uh, those pictures of the era of horse transport, the stagecoach, mm. back horse trails. And I was wondering why you, uh, what, what, you might, what you might think about uh, today's developers and councils who seem to be so keen to forget that past when they're providing active travel routes which only provide for walkers and cyclists when they could also easily provide for horse riders as well and you know there are more and more horse riders now whilst it'll never be a form of real active travel are keen to use their horses to uh, take journeys that they would previously have used their cars for. Yes, I mean, I think I think you're you're right that there's a huge opportunity, and of course, uh, I'm going back to think to to Pippa's point about um, you know making things work rather than seeing the conflicts. I mean, there, there there have been times in the past. I mean, where you know bridleways is it is it walkers is it cyclists is it horses, and actually it should be possible for all of those groups to to confidently use the countryside. I have seen more of these long distance, um, a bit like long distance walking routes, but you know. Uh, people setting up to welcome horses on long distance uh, routes and to, you know, really celebrate the fact that this is a, a means of travel that, you know, is sustainable and green, but it's also highly enjoyable. So I, I think we just keep talking about all the different ways in which people can enjoy the countryside and try not to get um, put in a box that says, oh, there's a problem here. 
you know, make it a, make it a positive rather than a, a conflict. Yeah. That would be good to have it as a positive. Um, Colin, just uh, do you want to just come in? You, yeah, you made a comment Colin's on the chat. Point. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Colin, do you want to come in and, and say anything about your point? Colin put something in the chat mm. about Open Access Scotland being a bit of a double edged sword in some places because um, people have monetized that access. Mm. And so you can get some impacts um, and development of infrastructure that that um, isn't, you know, probably isn't very complementary to beauty. Um, well, or the say, I was up, I was up in Northwest Sutherland uh, for half term with my family and um, I'd not seen the North Coast 500 at first hand before. So it's a mixture of, you know, you can see that it's brought benefits, particularly financial benefits, but actually it's also, you can see that there are problems and people kind of dashing around really fast and on these tiny roads. So um, I, I can absolutely see Colin's point. Um, I'm really interested in the case on Dartmoor at the moment, which Pippa, I'm sure you know all about the, um, and where that will take us because we we have got to we have got to I think create the whole point about wild camping and all the rest of it should it should be without infrastructure if at all possible it should be it should be highly respectable and and give people that sense of um, you know connection with nature it's not it's not about sophisticated kit it's about enjoying the beauty of nature so we'll see where that one goes to interesting point there Colin thanks. Yeah, yeah, an interesting case. If people aren't following it, it's about wild camping on Dartmoor um, and one landowner wants to stop it on their land. Um, and uh, lots of people are campaigning against that. Uh, and it's in the High Court uh, yesterday and today, I think. Mm. So, yes, it will be interesting to see where the judges go on that one, because um, there's been a history of wild camping on Dartmoor for well over 100 years. Um, so, yes. Um, We've almost re reached the end of our time, so I don't see any more hands, so I think we need to wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much, Fiona. I know you're a very busy person and it's been really great to have you today sharing your thoughts um, and inspiring us again. Um, uh, it, it's always great to hear from you. I would like to say to the, everybody on the call, we'd really appreciate your feedback. We've provided a, a link in the chat if you could give us some feedback. But also we'd really like to see you again in the members meeting. You've got 15 minutes to grab a tea, a coffee and maybe a sandwich. The members meeting is really informal. So bring your sandwich with you, uh, bring your tea, your coffee, your hot chocolate, your marshmallows, everything you want to have a really relaxed discussion amongst the members. There'll be a few people who want to tell you about stuff and share um, the latest research they've been doing this year. And you can share with um, everybody else what you've been doing. And also it's an opportunity to ask questions and say, is anybody doing something on? And there yeah, you can add that uh, word that is concerning you. Um, previously, we've talked about barbecues, open access, recreation and nature, all sorts of things. So please join us then. So I'd just like to wrap up and say thank you very much, Fiona. Um, and do have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you. Could I just say thank you? And I've, I've never seen these little clapping hands come on the screen before, which is very touching, actually, I have to say. So huge thanks. Um, I've really enjoyed being with you. I wish I could have been with you in person because I much prefer that in many, many ways. But I know that this is a way of talking to people I wouldn't normally get to see. So thank you very much, Pippa. All the very, very best. Your work is so important. I wish my all of you, you know, very, very good health and spirits in the years to come. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I shall leave. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.